the downside with the internet is there's so much information that people can get obsessed with looking for information, so they go way beyond what they're actually working on that will help them move forward at that point in time. Um, and I think that is a challenge with the internet because you can start looking at, you know, uh, discussions about, you know, improvising with modes, for example, and you end up in this massive rabbit hole and all the information is there before you. Whereas if you're working with somebody in person, they'll say, stop, work on this now and this will lead to this, will lead to that and you'll, it'll help you develop. And I think you can almost, I think that everyone, you know, it's, it's a trap to sort of start looking for information as opposed to learning skills. Jeff Chalmers has to have one of the most interesting careers in the bass world right now. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and I've been meaning to sit down and chat with Jeff about his career, about how he got into Discover Double Bass, about how it's evolved and what he sees for the future. And when I discovered that we were both going to be in Lucca, Italy for the European Bass Congress this summer, 2018, I just had to find some time to sit down with him. So what you're hearing today is a live podcast taping with not only Jeff, but also some other folks that were in attendance and chimed in, which is wonderful. We have Douglas Mapp and we have David Hayes chiming in as well. And this session reminds me of a panel discussion that I participated in at the 2009 International Society of Bases Convention. And this was titled Music in the Digital Age, and it featured past podcast guests, Frank Proto, Douglas Mapp, who you're also hearing today, and Mark Dresser, along with Phil Palumbi. So today we're digging in mostly with Jeff, but also with David and Douglas about where we came from, technologically speaking, relating to the base, of course, where we are right now and what we see for the future. And we go down some really interesting rabbit holes. I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors, Diderio Strings, Steve Swan String Bass, Colstein, and Upton Bass. More on them later, but let's dig into this conversation with Jeff Chalmers, Douglas Mapp, and David Hayes. Thanks for, I, I don't know, there are like nine events this hour, so thanks for hanging here with us and talking this, and, and, and uh, I was, I thought, I love chatting about like the state of, of the base world and how it's continued to be affected online. Douglas Mapp is in the room right here, and we'll introduce some other people too, but Douglas sent me this morning a PDF of the very first uh, base world, but it's called something else. I forget what it was called, but it was the, the first issue of what we have on the International Society of Bases. Was, was, was it the Soundpost? Sound it was the Soundpost. It was the International. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was the International Institute for String Bass, That's right? It. IISB yeah. was what it was called. And it was so cool to read that. So 1967, right? And we're looking at this. And the advisory board is a who's who of bass players, right? I think it's um, Stuart Sankey was on there. Uh, and Scott, Roger Brown. Mm -hmm. um, I forget who the others are. Real big names. Right. And, and it's just cool to see. So there's this, there's this kind, of, kind, of, kind of manifesto by Gary Carr about what he hopes this group to accomplish. And it's really cool to read it 51 years later and be like, wow, this is like what we're still talking about today. You know, we want to uh, we want to unite the bass community across jazz lines and classical lines. And we want to uh, share information and learn about techniques and, and instrument building. And we want to uh, be able to share music more freely. And it's, it's just so cool to see like how uh, there's nothing new under the sun <laughs> in a way, right? Like what we're talking about 2017, 2018 is exactly the same. Um, so thank you for sending that. And, and I thought it would be interesting to, uh, I've been meaning to chat with my friend Jeff Chalmers of Discover Double Bass here anyway for the podcast. I thought how cool uh, to chat live and hopefully some other people would be here and, and we've got several people who are active in the internet world in different capacities. Maybe we could just talk about what things looked like 10 years ago, what they look like now, what you think is going to happen in five years. Um, and I've got a mic there if anyone wants to hop in. Um, f feel, feel free. So uh, maybe we could just start by talking about your story, Jeff. Uh, what, who are you and what do you do? 
Well, my, yeah, as you say, thanks, thanks for having us, first of all, Jason. It's really cool to uh, kind of, you know, chat to you about, about all of this stuff. I, and to be here at the, the Congress as well has been a really amazing uh, experience and to, you know, to meet so many new people. And, um, and yeah, my, my name's Jeff Chalmers and I run um, basically a, a business that's, that provides online uh, courses. That's really what, what we do. So essentially it's about producing and creating courses by... You know, people uh, that really make a difference to your playing. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically working with the players that I really enjoy working with and, you know, have relationships with people like Lauren Pierce and Danny Zeman and Adam Ben Ezra. And then over the next kind of six months, there's another four people who are due to release new courses to the, uh, to the website as well. And we're trying to be really broad and provide, you know, information in a new way because... There's so much incredible information out there already. There are so many people who have done, on, you know, who have done video courses, which is essentially what we're talking about. You know, there are people like Francois Rabath and Ray Brown and John Clayton Jr. Uh, you know, the list is, is huge that have, uh, that have recorded uh, video kind of masterclasses. But I think it's becoming more sophisticated over the last five years. Online learning in the way that you can curate the content and you can break it up into uh, more effective um, units that you know really create transformation within the students. So there's a lot you know there's a, a lot more to it than just kind of presenting the information. It has to be done in a really careful way. And then there's so many exciting opportunities to include other you know materials. So for instance, more detailed transcriptions, more you know uh, backing tracks to to, uh, to work with and what have you. And I'm really just focusing on trying to bring as much of that information and present it in these courses that I you know, uh, offer on discoverablebase.com. So. Okay, so let me ask an evil question. Go on. Are, are you just trying to... St- we have a bunch of base teachers in yeah. the room. I'm a base teacher too. Jeff, are you trying to destroy all of double base education with this guy? Like, are we all going to be out of a job here in the next couple of years? No, it would take a lot more than uh, uh, the internet to get people out of a job. No, absolutely not. I mean, that's the funny thing is that people are, sometimes kick back and, you know, always the answer when you might be on a forum someone is looking for information, the answer is always to get it from a teacher. And of course, that's absolutely the right thing to do. People need to have a relationship with teachers. The online material that's there that's been presented by people like John Patitucci um, for Artist Works or Christy McBride for uh, Open Studio Network, then none of these guys are saying that it's a way of replacing a teacher. Or Ray Brown's BBC Masterclass, he even makes that point at the start of it. Everybody is just providing information in a new way. And it's a more, you know, detailed way than just in text. Um, you know, you, traditionally we're talking about information products like books, then we're VHS videos, and they were very limited in the way that they, in terms of length and in terms of structure. And the great thing about courses is that you can break down chapters into classes and you can really provide the information in a more logical way. But it's really a, you know, it's a one-way street. So you're not going to get the feedback that you need. And, and yeah, there are I mean, courses of things like, so for instance, John Patitucci does... Uh, video exchange where you can play for him and he'll get back to you and what have you. But even that's not the same as being in the room with a teacher and having your hands on the instrument and what have you. So it's in no way supposed to, you know, we talk about online lessons, but really it's video courses. You know, it's, it, it's nobody got, you know, freaked out by reading a book thinking this is going to, you know, the Ray Brown base method doesn't negate the private lessons that people have. It's just a way of providing information. And also I think that people need to be smart about where they get the information from, because all of these resources I've just mentioned are absolutely incredible. But there's a real mix of stuff, and it depends what you want to achieve. And people are getting overwhelmed with information. So I think it's really smart to work with someone who can maybe point you in the direction of some of the materials that you need. So they'll say, I mean, you know, that Douglas and David, uh, David Hayes and Douglas Mapp are both, you, you know, publishers, and, you know, their tutors will, well, you know, if you're working with a tutor, they'll, they'll suggest maybe go and check out one of their you know, publications, and it's just the same with, uh, with this uh, type of learning as well. Uh, how, we couldn't have done this 10 years ago, right? You yeah. couldn't be doing what you're doing even 10 years ago. Absolutely. Right, the tools have evolved. Yeah. When did you get the idea to do this? How, tell, tell us just how, how did this get started? Because, I mean, I've, I've been putting out videos for over 10 years. I don't think anybody was doing anything like what you're doing well, 10 years ago, were they? I, no, I mean, essentially... No, I mean, yeah, looking back, I was, I was yeah, it's, uh, you know, I've been doing this for five years. It's the five-year anniversary this next month, I think, of the website that I've been doing it. Um, and, you know, I've been, yeah, working flat out since then to develop the content and improve the offering that we're doing. And I, I got into it because I was working alongside uh, a friend and colleague who works in the bass guitar space. 
So he was doing like an online bass guitar lessons type thing. I became really interested in the internet. Um, and, you know, there were so many people out there doing great things, so many great double bass videos, like your Andy Anderson videos. I remember specifically seeing the videos that you, and I've watched them many times about French bow technique with Andy Anderson, and thinking I'd love to do something like this. And I was teaching a lot, you know, I was working as a professional freelancer and teacher in the jazz space. Um, and I had some, you know, some classical training, but really I'm a jazz bass player. And, um, yeah, I was kind of starting to see more and more people doing this stuff online. Uh, I got more and more interested in it. I started working with another business doing, um, essentially working in terms of producing material. Uh, and I kind of found my way into that as, uh, I think the first job I had was as a transcriber. So I ended up working for this other business, uh, Scott's Bass Lessons, and they required uh, some transcription doing. So I did this big project for three months where I worked full-time transcribing bass guitar material and then, uh, you know, started to make the connection and thought, hang on, I'm going to have a go at this on double bass and... You know, I started putting my own material out, my own lessons out, and they were, you know, did well. And then I created my own courses, and then I started producing courses with other people, so Lauren Pierce. And then, you know, in the last year, uh, I've been working on bringing in new artists as well, and that's very much the ambition for the next, you know, next kind of few years, really, is to, to be able to share more information. Uh, so I find it fast. I, we, at the t- 2009 ISB convention, Mark Dresser organized a panel discussion. Douglas, I don't know if you were involved in that discussion. Uh, but but it was it was the the state state of affairs in, uh, music in the digital age. I think it was what it was called, and it was addressing some of those concerns. And Jeff is highlighting some of the upsides of technology. I mean, you couldn't be doing. I mean, this is your gig. Your this is yeah. your full time gig is yeah. creating this and producing this and connecting with these artists and. So the, there was an upside. Um, obviously, there's an upside and a downside to technology. And we mm. talked a, a bit in 2009. I mean, it's 10 years ago at this point. But it's still very relevant about uh, how technology has affected musicians adversely, but then also how some of the positives and what we can do to make a living. So um, I think one thing, Jason, that yeah. like a downside that's just jumped into my mind that I, that I think is always a challenge that as teachers what we face is that we can explain concepts to students and they can understand the concept and they think, great, now I understand whatever the, you're teaching them, French bow technique, or they understand the scale and they understand the fingering and they understand how to improvise, what have you, but they can't actually do, they haven't done the work so they can't actually do it. Mm-hmm. And I think the downside with the internet is there's so much information that people can get obsessed with looking for information, so they go way beyond what they're actually working on that will help them move forward at that point in time. Um, and I think that is a challenge with the internet because you can start looking at, you know, uh, discussions about, you know, improvising with modes, for example, and you end up in this massive rabbit hole and all the information is there before you. Whereas if you're working with somebody in person, they'll say, stop, work on this now and this will lead to this, will lead to that and you'll help you develop. And I think you can almost, I think that everyone, you know, it's, it's a trap to sort of start looking for information as opposed to learning skills. You know, so I think you need to be careful to cement what people, well, people need to be careful when they're learning. And of course, that's the same as in person or online. But I think because you don't have the teacher maybe pulling you back and, and saying, actually, you think you can do that. You know, how many times have we, you know, think we can do something and then we, you know, we try and do it. And actually, you know, the, the reality is it's not there yet. You might understand the concept but not be able to execute it. So yeah, infer- there, we're drowning in information. Yeah, absolutely. And if you go on YouTube and you type Capuzzi Concerto, you see, uh, you know, 39 different performances of people maybe they're in middle school at the shaky cam and maybe so so curation is a huge thing and 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 taking and shaking yeah because all the information is out there freely available to do anything that you want to do you could learn to build a house you could learn to build a base you could learn to play the double bass you know you could learn the information that you need to do it but it doesn't necessarily follow that you actually are, are, are able to do it at the end and i think it's really important to try and you know, help curate the information as much as possible and present it to your students in the, in the right way. And then very much what I've done is like chunked off topics, whether it be, you know, we've got a new course about German bow technique and the tutor who's working on that is, has absolutely broken down everything into really like logical steps uh, and very much focused on the fundamentals. But of course, you're not going to be able to execute that without a teacher. You know, you're going to still need to uh, be working with someone to put your hands on the instrument and help you move forward that way. In terms of just musicians broadly, so so you're a great example of somebody who's who's really latched onto this the, the yeah. tools that we have and and using them to the to 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 really build something vibrant that's really helpful to bass players. 
bass players or bass composers or bass teachers, like if, if, if you were advising someone just coming up right now, they're 17 or 18, what would you advise them in terms of making a living in this art? How, how do you think that's changed? How do you think, you know, and we have some other people who are finding their way. I mean, all of us are finding their way, but I, Andres Martins in here who's combining uh, composition and performing and all that. David Hayes uh, publish, you know, I don't even know how much you publish over the years and obviously combining it with, with teaching and performing. So, but, but maybe Jeff, we could start with what, what, what would you tell someone coming? And I know this is an impossible question so, so sorry yeah yeah but what would you what would you advise someone to do with their time uh maybe how would they how would you say someone use or not use the digital tools available to them it's i, I think it's i mean ultimately whether whatever you're doing whether you're composing or whether you're a player or, or what have you that the key is to be able to do what you're saying that you're going to be able to do you know whether you, whatever you're wanting to achieve whether yeah you're developing your teaching or your performance or what have you, ultimately it's still a big network of people and you ultimately get work from other people. I got work from my teacher, you know, Zoltan Decaney. I had an amazing uh, jazz bass teacher. He gave me, you know, lots of the sort of professional work that I then came to rely on and what have you. And ultimately it's all about results, you know. You still need to be able to do what you're going to do. But what the internet can help you is to connect and reach out and get to know people in a, in a quicker way. So I'm... I get to know, uh, you know, people here, and, and I've got many, many friends online, like Douglas, before um, we met, we've, you know, we've met recently, Douglas, Matt, but I've, you know, I've connected with him online before, and I think in terms of just, it's, it's not so different from real life, you know, and I think all I'd say is that whilst you could get, you could go down the route of looking at kind of marketing yourself in that way, I'm, I'm not really a fan of that, I think more about connections with people. Um, and just presenting what you can do because it's a meritocracy if you've got a great lesson or if you want to create a course or if you want to create an album or uh, if you want to compose and publish you know all the you know all the tools are there for everybody now you can do whatever you whatever you want to do but I think it's easy to get fixated on you know on, on having a smooth looking video whereas actually the reality is having great material actually you know has a, has a really powerful impact and all of the stuff that's done really well online. For instance, Postmodern Jukebox is a great example of that. So they're um, a fantastic band, and they're doing uh, arrangements of uh, pop tunes in a jazz style. Now, that's not new. That was being done for a significant amount of time before they started. And they started with one camera, so they had real limitations. One camera in front of them, and what they did is were really creative, and they did it excellently. They executed excellently with this really basic setup, and that's actually become their look. So they don't have multiple camera angles of fancy production. There's no barrier to entry. It's only, you know, it's a real meritocracy. They do well because they do great arrangements that people like. It might not be particularly innovative or modern, but it's just done excellently. You know, and if you want to be the guy that's doing a jazz trio or what have you, or, you know, composing or creating courses or whatever you're doing, there's no barrier now, so... This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. Steve has been active in the bass world and also the guitar world for years. Here's a bit from our live podcast taping with Steve on how he got into that business. Guitars and basses. Guitars and basses. Okay, how did that happen? They're both helper instruments. I've always played the rhythm guitar quite often with bass lines moving, either in swing style, jazz style, or country style. Bass is the same thing, supporting the band, the group of people you're playing with. So I've always felt like I was a support person. I love how Steve describes being a support person, and he is certainly that for the bass community here on the West Coast, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. His shop is located just south of San Francisco, and he has a large retail showroom with about 70 basses on display. And these basses are professional top-of-the-line basses. These basses are student-level basses and everything in between. They're beautifully set up. So if you're looking for a bass or you know someone who is, be sure to check out Steve at steveswanstringbass.com. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast, Steve. This episode is brought to you by D'Addario Strings. Our friends at D'Addario want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. Here's a great tip. Change your strings two at a time, removing them from the inside out, then replacing them from the outside in allows for easy access to the lower pegs, ensuring strings lay neatly in the peg box. 
Learn more at orchestral.dedario.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. How, how, do, how do I promote my, my project or how does someone promote their project without feeling sleazy? Yeah, I, 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 I know. I don't want to feel sleazy. I don't want yeah, to like... Hey, yeah. I, yeah. Get advise me, Jeff. I, I hate it. I hate having to say the word like, you know, yeah, I, I push or push back from that. I hate having to, uh, you know, yeah, talk about the sales aspect of it. But obviously, if you, I mean, ultimately, I think you've got to get your head around that if you want to do a project and you feel, you feel like, you know, um, you're, so David Hayes is a composer and he's sharing his compositions. He feels confident about it, excited about it. And he has to let people know about them. And he's really good at, you know, at sharing that stuff, um, you know, the, uh, online. And I, and I think you need to get past the fact that ultimately for it to be sustainable, it has to work. You know, so David sells his compositions and people buy them and they enjoy performing them. And then other people, you know, and, and it's ultimately, if you're providing something and it makes a difference in their playing, then, you know, it's okay. And after a while, I'd ended up getting so many messages saying how, how much my material was helping people. I kind of started to get past it. And now I'm presenting... I mean, the course that I did with Danny Zeman recently, we did one about playing in a trio. I absolutely love that course. I just love the material. Danny's done an amazing job. So I'm happy to say to people that, you know, that you can buy it. And it is a bit awkward, you know, uh, promoting stuff. And it's not something that comes naturally, certainly to me. But it's... Um, you just need to get out there. And, you know, whether it's on social media, or, you know, whether it's via an email list, all of these... There's all these kind of things that you can learn about connecting with people. But ultimately... You know, if you're going to help somebody, then you need to not be squeamish about saying, you know, that it's, it's there and, you know, doing things in the right way. People will ultimately come and, and they'll stay, you know. Um, and if it wasn't good, people would leave, you know, and they wouldn't buy and it wouldn't work. Talking about Facebook, Jeff. <laughs> I live in San Francisco. I, yeah. I uh, you know, the Facebook vans come up my street and pick up people. So, like, I, I think about Facebook a lot. Uh, we all spent time. David Hayes has... has built these projects that are just absolutely monumental, these history of the double bass yes, in, a, the double in, a, bass. in a hundred works. What are some of the ones that you've done, David, o over the last few years? With everything, Kuzovisky Concerto, Dragonetti Concerto, and those pieces which were important in the, our repertoire, but also pieces which had a story. Um, so some of them are not important pieces, but I like the idea of including that composer, because they're part of our heritage, part of, of where we're from. And we're, we're building on, on the past. And, but I absolutely love doing it. And it's everything which was my interest, because I, I love the repertoire. I started collecting music when I was about 15 or 16. Um, and I, I just haven't stopped yet. And I love the history of the bass, the composers, and, and where we are now. And people say about Sim Andal. I, I think Sim Andal is fantastic. He was a pioneer of his day. But he's, he's old-fashioned now. But so he should be. Because he did such a good job, he allowed us to build on it so that we're now where we are. My things should become old-fashioned. If they stay relevant, then I've, nothing has moved forward. It should move forward. I, people seem to like my music, which is, is very, very flattering. I've, I've been very, very successful in only five years. Um, but there's a space for all of us now. That's the great thing about it. I didn't start composing until I was about 52. I, I didn't know I had any skill. I always worked with great composers. Um, and then I was publishing some music by Bernard Sal, uh, Portraits for Friends, and he'd written one two-page pieces for lots of his bass playing friends. Uh, and there's one for me. And I thought, I'll do that for my students. I'll write a piece for each of my students. And each one has a different character, different personality. So I tried to, to do that. And then some people would say, oh, I, I like that. Can I have a copy? Um, would you write a piece for me? Yeah, of course I would. I was, I was saying to Jeff earlier, I'm really confident as a composer. I, d I don't sound good. I just sound confident. Because I know that when I send a piece out, I've revised it 40 times. And I know it's the best I can do. Um, but it, the, the internet has opened possibilities for me to make contact. I didn't know you. Jim. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, Jason, you and I, we <laughs> met first in Prague yep. two years ago. Yeah. Um, and that's been amazing. So I'm, I'm meeting so many people here I've never met before, but we've been friends on Facebook for years. And Facebook is, is good and bad. It can be, it's how you use it. It's ultimately, you're talking about how to earn a living. Um, it's ultimately down to you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's nothing to do with your teachers. It's nothing to do with anything, anybody else. It's ultimately down to you. Are you a team player? Are you not a team player? Mm. You have to work out you're one or the other. Mm. Okay, and if you're a team player, join the team. Yeah. And if you're not a team player, don't 
don't join a team. Because <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll hate you and you'll hate them. Let's and, and, and I worked out very quickly, I'm not a team player. I love working by myself and I have no problem at all. Um, I'll listen to advice, you know, if you say, why don't you try it that way, I'll, I'll think about it. Um, and if I think you're right, I'll follow it. And if I think you're not right, I won't follow it. But I will listen. I'm not an idiot. I, I do listen a lot because that's how you learn and that's how you develop. But this is something I, I teach my students. Um, what are your skills? What do you want to do? Well, most of them will end up playing orchestras. That's great. So be the best orchestral player you can be. But also have the solo play. Don't let that go. Um, I had dinner with, with Ludwig Stryker in Vienna many years ago. And he said, um, I think in his 20s, he was a member of the Vienna Philharmonic. And he wanted to be a soloist. And all his, all his colleagues made fun of him. And so he stopped doing it. Mm. And then in his 40s, um, he was asked to do a recital. And his wife recorded a rehearsal. And she gave it to an agent. And the agent liked what he heard. And from that, the career developed. So it's amazing. So he had a 20-year period when he, he didn't play solos just because of peer pressure. Um, and so I, I explained to students that often the, the people around you won't be as enthusiastic as you. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. They're happy in their world. Let them be happy in their world. Don't challenge them. But make sure you have a life beyond. You may find teaching is something you want to do. Well, we need great teachers. That's how you get great players. Um, composers. Recording engineers. There's so many different areas in music. So you might start out being a, a player, and then you go in a different direction. But that's, that's the nice thing about the internet. I have students who come in for a lesson, um, and they've always got 15 questions. They've listened to 15 different players, and, and they'll, they'll mention, uh, there's one particular pupil, Alex, and he's really fantastic. And uh, he'll come in, he'll say, oh, I saw this, this person playing this. I thought, I, I know him. I sat on a competition jury with him. He said, do you know everybody? I said, I, I know one or two. I know one or two. <laughs> but it's interesting because that's how I was. I always had 15 questions for my teachers because I was interested. I wanted to know how you get from A to B and why, why I couldn't get from A to B. What's the problem? What's stopping me? And then once I'm at B, how do I get to C? And I, I just wanted to move forward as a player, teacher, composer. Um, but I, I like the, the balance of things. I have, because I, I play, I teach, I compose, I publish, I organise workshops, things like that. And for me, that's perfect, because I'm, a, I'm my own boss. And it plays to my strengths. I was, I was also telling Jeff that I, I nearly became a head of strings. And I got down to the last two. And what was nice was that the last two of us were viola and bass, because usually it's violin or cello. Right. So it's fantastic, viola and bass. So it went on our strengths and our skills, not on the instrument. Um, and they chose the viola player. But with hindsight, I was so grateful I didn't get the job because it would have taken me away from the bass. Everything I do now is 100% bass. But as a head of strings, it would have been 6% bass, 94% non-bass. So with hindsight, I think it's the right thing. But ultimately, it's down to you. It's down to, and this is what you have to teach your students. It's down to them. What do they want from it? But what Jeff said was fantastic. It doesn't matter how glossy it is. If the product you have doesn't match the gloss, right. you've got no chance. You've got and, no chance. And that thing about like, playing to your strengths, it's like this is the thing that I've found that I'm able to reach, to impact the most, to do the most. You know, when I was teaching one-on-one -on -one and what have you, I enjoyed it and the people, you know, I've got really fond memories of doing that. But, you know, this allow, I feel really proud about working with some really incredible people to create stuff that will, you know, it's, it's about finding that. And you never know. I mean, I had, had no idea that I'd end up doing this, you know. I know all these people like... Um, uh, that are doing incredible things, and you can go and reach out directly to them. I mean, has that been your experience, Jason, on well, Facebook? Well, I, I, yeah, I think, I think it's interesting. I, 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 it's always interesting to me, like, how people end up finding those strengths. Like Dave was just describing, he didn't yeah. start composing until the last f five years, right? Yeah. And I know Andres uh, Martin here uh, didn't, didn't start out as a composer, right? Uh, that was something that evolved for you when you were playing in uh, Tijuana, and now music being played all over the world. I mean, a lot of people would say you're a composer. That would be the first label they would, they would attach to you. Um, uh, Douglas, when did you start Douglas Map Music? It was my accident. Like, like now, my original product that nobody even buys. Like, I first started out making cassette tapes of many recordings of piano accompaniments. And I told one of my friends in the orchestra that I did this, and one day we were playing the West, I said, check this out. 
and she played the mom concerto with my computer. And she says, man, that would be a great practice tool. And six months went by, I didn't think about it, but I was just doing it for myself, and my teacher thought it was really cool, you know, like I would go to my lesson with my Sony Walkman Pro with a cassette recording with a piano player. I said, oh, that's really cool. And then this woman's husband called me up and said, hey, Douglas, I want to buy a, a couple of your tapes. And I was like, I'm not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, the technology was much better for making cassettes than it is for CDs. Like, like what I would do is I would sell a person a nine minute tape for 15 bucks. You know, which basically I would put a 45 minute tape in, I'd string together three sequences, I'd press record, I'd come back in 45 minutes, I'd turn the tape over, I'd record three more things, and I'd mail it off, you know, and as I got into it, I started learning how to use Fali, I was a copyist, and then at one point I was given a recital, and I didn't want a solo tune, so I, I didn't even know what the first piece we did was, but um, somebody came to my recital, I said, hey man, you're not solo tuning. I said, yeah man, put the part in the key major. I said, man, can I get a copy of that? And like that was the next thing I did. And now that you know people can like you could be in Sweden and you need dinner store from D major and you can come to my website and within twelve or twenty-four hours you can print it, you know. So it was all by accident, you know, and I probably like made more mistakes than I did good decisions, but you know, like I see lots of names of people that bought my products that are like major symphony orchestras or or in competitions and stuff like that. So I know the product was... We were buying your MIDI from Argentina 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I used your tapes in the world. They were famous. <laughs> Slippery slope, right? And it's something that every musician, sure, because, yeah, yeah, right, right. And and yeah, there, there's the expectation. That's a really hard expectation to shake, yeah. you know. Now and even with streaming services, and we'll see how that ultimately plays out. Right now, it's it's almost comical how little a musician makes on yeah. Spotify or Apple Music or whatever. One thing that has impressed me about Upton Bass ever since I got to know them was how many artists there are out there that are so satisfied with the work that Upton has done for them. Here's Lucia Torino of The Devil Makes Three, outstanding band, on her experiences with Upton. I have the Upton travel bass. A friend of mine who was in a band called Brown Bird, I think she'd had some work done on her bass, and she had a pickup that she got from Upton, and she knew one of the guys who worked down in the... Um, factory in, in Mystic. Also, calling it a factory is really charming because it's really just a barn that smells amazing with lots of cool bases and, and very sweet men. Chris Wood, he had two Chadwick bases with him. And so I like 
got my courage up and sort of sidled over to him at one point. I was like, I need a bass. What should I get? <laughs> and I talked about Chadwick and about Upton. And he was like, honestly, I'd go with the Upton. Learn more at UptonBass.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast, guys. Buying a double bass is a challenge for sure, and it's not getting any easier. That's why it's so great that Colsteins is offering interest-free financing on select instruments, bows, and instrument repair purchases. Learn more at Colstein.com, and while you're there, check out their wonderful selection of pedigree instruments and bows and everything else that they have to offer. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Um, and that's a tough thing, like Jeff. Like you, you, you uh, are spend a lot of time or have built a lot of things on YouTube, right? Which there's that expectation of free. And w- what are your thoughts on free content and pay? Like, 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 what, what's well, what's that look like for you? What's the future of that? I, I think it's. It's kind of, I think it's a great system, really, YouTube, in the way that it's worked for me with my lessons and with the lessons of the tutors at Discoverable Base is that we're putting lessons out there. And so, so for one of Adam Ben Ezra's lessons, people might watch that, I don't know, however many thousand times or what have you, and a small percentage of people will really engage with it. And a small, you know, and a percentage of those people will, you know, re- will then think, actually, I want to, you know, I, want, I, want, I like this so much that I want to go forward and take a course, you know. And it's so cheap in, compared, in comparison to actually going and... I mean, you can't get that information any other way. You know, you can kind of look at the little different bits, but the access to these courses, and not just... I'm not talking about Discoverable Base specifically, all of, all of them, you know. I mean, you do artist work to John Palatucci or Christopher Bice Force, whatever. It's, I mean, in considering the access to the artists that you get, and it's completely unique. They're all their own compositions, so, you know, it's not... There isn't a huge barrier of entry if you wanted to take a course with somebody that you really like. And... And I think that you've just got to accept that the material that you put out, then, hey, if it helps, you know, however many thousand people watch it, you know, most of them enjoy it, great. Of those, you know, it has a really positive effect and helps a lot of people, fantastic, everything's good. And then if some people want to buy something, then that's, that's even better. But it's not, it's not done in the way of, um, you can't be expecting to essentially make money from putting things on YouTube, you know, whether it's based, the base world is too small, you know, I mean, like the revenue that I make from, YouTube ads is negligible. It's not really anything that you know that that justifies the expense of doing it. Um, and it's uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's it's you know, people hear pieces and they hear some of Davis' pieces on YouTube and they think, yeah, you know, a lot of them will just enjoy it, and then some of them will really enjoy it, and of those, some people will buy it. And with Douglas's cassette tapes, you know, I bet you there's been a bunch of people who just thought I would really love piano accompaniment for the piece now whilst we've been talking about that. And, yeah. You know, and if, if Douglas was to, I'm sure that there's free material and what have you and then people like that. You were going to jump in, Doug? I was, I was going to say that, like, what you're talking about is, is one of the challenges the music business has now. Like, like you think, like, you make 100 videos, you put three of them on YouTube so that people can sort of find out who you are. Yeah. And hopefully... You know, like a thousand people see it, I don't know what you would consider a good return, but if like um, five people became customers, you might consider that like a good return. Like, like, like live musicians are, are doing that now. Like, so like, you know, you go back 100 years, the record company would make you to pay you to make a record. And now like, you're making your own records and you're giving them away at your shows with hopes that people will come to more of your shows or go to your, go to your website so you can mm-hmm. make a little bit of ad traffic or something like that. But the whole model, like it is even upside down, but we just took the model and threw it out because most of us are given away by what we would consider the best part of our product yeah. and trying to make money on the different streets. Like my brother's a road manager for all these different markets. Like right now he's, he's out on the road with um, a guy that's um, one of the monkeys. And um, like they, they give away CDs. And they're hoping that like, everybody that spends 50 bucks for a ticket will spend another 25 bucks on merch. Mm. You know, so like one of their hugest revenue streams is merchandise. You know, so so it used to be, like if you go to see like an old time app, like if you go to go to see like Turn of Forever or Chicken Real, like they're selling CDs. But if you go to see like any of these younger rock apps and stuff like that, they're giving away download key cards, giving away CDs and stuff like that, just trying to keep you as part of their community, you know, and the bigger their community is, you know, like uh, you know, nine inch nails like they get like Hundred thousand people go to their website every day. Well, that they monetize that, you know. And these, these, uh, you know, I miss. I'm old enough, and many of us in here too. 
the LP. And you open up the LP and you put that in you're looking at the liner notes and you're holding this in your hands. And you know, I just miss that. I love the digital world, but I do miss that. And I gotta think in terms of sheet music too, you know, our composers and publishers here, what are your thoughts either on Drace or David? Uh, <laughs> the physical the, the 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 physical printed score, PDF parts, how that's changed. It, Advantages and negatives. Uh, any thoughts from the those kind of, or Douglas, who's in the print business? I mean, I, actually, I'm almost to the point that I want to say I don't want to sell printed music, but I know I'm going to disenfranchise a certain segment of the community. But printed music is um, it's so different. You know, like we say, um, well, why do you sell PDF? You well, can share that freely. Um, anybody that's living in the first or second world can either go in their house or go to Staples or somewhere. They can scan music and while they're at Staples, they can email to all their friends. You know, so even, even if I wasn't selling PDFs, um, some smart student said, oh, I just got the dinner for in D major. You know, Doug Matt and John did that. This. I'm gonna scan it so all my friends can have it. So they can just take pictures with the phone. They, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 With his phone. So why should I go to the trouble of buying expensive paper, you know, print, like having a nice printer, you know, buying toner, um, like printing the music, buying it, uh, putting it on a with a piece of cardboard, going to the post office, telling people I want them to stamp it with two knots, then down the and then 10 days later getting an email from the person saying the music can't have been I don't to send me another one. And like, what, like, the first thing I do is I send them out yeah. because all I need is for that person to say, don't oh, my music, yeah. like rip me off of eight dollars, you know, and so printed music is a challenge, but like, like, like you go somewhere and you see some music that you sold to the person printed it all like the paper towel, and your name's in the bottom line. Yeah. You know, how does that reflect on you? You know, look at this crappy music that Douglas Smith music sold. You know. Yeah, versus cracking open that Barry Rider edition or whatever. Uh, just that, you know, the, 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 and we're seeing this in other media too, like Nine Inch Nails is a great example. Or bands like this, they're putting out now, you know, they, they give the music away or get people into your network and then put out the $150, like, really high end. I think there's probably always going to be a space for that, like, especially that beautiful physical product. But it is a challenge. And then, yeah. The vinyls. Yeah. Cassettes are coming back. Who's got tunes at a thousand dollars on their on yeah. their yeah. And people pay to have a solution sold if they, they want to have that experience. You know, you can buy an MP3 player, you can buy a twenty thousand dollar recording system, and you know, sorry, a hi-fi system, or you know, you can uh, watch free videos, or you could watch, uh, you know, you could watch John Patitucci's got I don't know four or five great free videos on YouTube, or you could go and take his course, you know, or you could, and it's. Um, and there's always going to be that sort of group of people who actually want the easy, you know, the solution, not the easy solution, but the, the you know, the, the best solution. Like, I don't mind paying for sheet music because I prefer to actually have the physical copy. So I'll, you know, you could, you could find, you know, free versions of things online. I guess the tricky thing is, is when other people take it and start to sell it, that's when it gets a little bit nasty. If you go on iTunes, there's a lot of apps that have been kind of where that have, people have taken other people's material and put them in app form. I spend a fair amount of time dealing with that. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, I think most bass players are cool, and they recognise that you know we're all just doing this because we all love double bass. You know, nobody's kind of, you know, it's not you're not dealing with Apple or some faceless company or what have you. Douglas is literally taking the stuff in his hands. You know, I'm. Yeah, you know, it's the same thing for all of us. We're all working really hard uh, to do what we do, and um, you know, I think most people sort of respect that, and they could share a lot more than they actually do. You know. That personal connection is so valuable. Like, like yeah. someone who knows David and reads everything he's done, and sees all the, the that he gives to the base yeah. community. I mean, you you want to people start to follow along or Andres and his compositions and uh, follow. And I mean, I think that we see that following with people on Facebook and Instagram too, yeah. or Douglas and the work with the ISB and all this work over the years with the with the the transcriptions mm -hmm. and the. I mean, it, so I think that personal connection is is. It's always been important, but it's probably even more important in this world where we're drowning in information. And absolutely, absolutely, Jason. Yeah. So take me into the future. 
Ten minutes if you, oh, okay. oh, I don't know. Let's go. It's 2018 yeah. right now. Take us to five years, ten years down the road. Uh, what are we going to be? What are we going to be? What's going to be different? What are we not going to be talking about? What are we going to be complaining about? What are we going to be celebrating? Big questions. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think the. I mean, obviously, the means of production just keep improving and yeah. getting easier and more accessible. You know, if you want to create a video course, if we talk about, you know, what I do, then it gets easier and easier. If you want to self-publish music, it's becoming. You know, or whatever you're doing, or, or, or your own recordings, it's becoming easier and easier, and the standard is getting higher and higher. And it'll be really interesting to see where that goes, because you could do so much with just an iPhone now, you know, that is a, a, a real... I mean, you could create something really fantastic, and you could just put it straight online. You know, it's all about the, you know, about the content. So I think, you know, there'll be some, you know, like, young kind of kid who's inventing something at the minute that will come along and completely change the delivery. But, I mean, essentially, the core will all be the same. You know, great music, great lessons... Uh, whatever people are engaging great compositions it's the same um, but it's all of these methods of delivery I mean all the social media stuff will change um, but I just think there'll be more and more people working in the online space um, and more and more you know businesses doing similar similar things to what I'm doing maybe more people doing podcasts yeah. I don't know I can't imagine well, that, you know yeah no, no, I know. You know, but it's, it's yeah. like it's all of these kind of things you know that it'll become easier and easier and, and, and there'll be some amazing young guy out there or young girl you know young person who will, who will come along and, and, and put something in, incredible out there that we, we can't foresee, really. It's just going to keep changing and just become more of a democracy and more and easier access to information, I think. Well, when's, when's virtual reality going to get? When am I going to be able to put my bow hand into this glut and like be able to feel the bow strokes or like look from different... Skype lessons, you know. I mean, you yeah. can have a lesson with... I don't know, I'm just off the top of my head, I know Tom Martin does lessons, yeah. you know. I mean, well, David Hayes has been doing, yeah. you've done some Skype lessons yeah. too. You can reach out to these people, and it's getting better and better, and a Skype lesson three or four years ago is not as good as one now, and in, in, you know, in a couple of years' time, the technology will be different, we won't be talking about Skype, it'll be something else, and it'll be, you know, we'll reach that point where you'll be able to play in real time with the student, and that's the problem at the moment that I think is, it's not particularly straightforward to do, but I mean, fast forward ten years, it's bound to be a completely, you know, you'll do it on your phone or whatever you have in those days. What do, you, what do you think? Uh, well, uh, what, I, I, what worries me is when is AI going to take over? When are the machines going to take over? Yeah. And that'll be it. How many years do we have left, Jeff? I reckon probably two or three. Two or three? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think in ten years' time, we'll still be talking about the same things. Yeah. It'll yeah. just be different. Does it start at a down bow or an up bow? Yeah. Is it a G sharp in tune? I think nothing will change. I think it's been the same for 200 years. It's just that the means of delivery has changed. Uh, and the means of delivery will change. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I did a blog, and I, well, I go out and do recitals, and I'm still astounded in 2018 that people will still say, I didn't know the bass could do that. I didn't know the bass could sound so nice. And this is 2018. And how many of us have been promoting the base for how long? And we're still yeah. coming out. It's fantastic that people recognise it. That's great. However, this is 2018. Yeah. Well, we're making such progress, though. If you think about people like yeah. G- Renaud Garcia Fons or uh, uh, someone really popular in terms of um, like people like Adam Ben Ezra uh, or Kate Davis, even with Postman on the Jukebox, yeah. uh, you know, they're reaching the mainstream audience. They are literally having millions of views, not thousands or even hundreds of thousands. These are people are actually having, you know, an impact to the real to the real world that people have never seen a double bass before or don't really understand it. Are starting to see, you know, more and more about what can be done with it. And I just hope that it keeps pushing forward. And it feels like a really exciting time for the instrument. Well, that's the power of something like YouTube is you can, yeah. if something can, you know, get, get that kind of attention. Yeah. This is what I've said so many times. This is a golden age. Yeah. The base. But how lucky are we to be part of this golden age? Because it is. It's, it's never been better. The, the level of playing has never been higher. The level of teaching has never been better. Um, the number of compositions has never been better. Just the opportunities. The instruments, the string technology. Yeah, everything. everything. It's the best it's ever been. We're how really lucky are we to be part of this? I can't believe... I started playing when I was 14, and it was like, wow, what a different world it was for all those years. And you can't believe it. It was like the Stone Age. It's unbelievable. I think you were climbing out and playing the apple smart or the Oh, yeah. That was it. That was it. You learn one solo piece, and then you got a job in an orchestra. Yeah. <laughs> if you got your own bow, you were principal. <laughs> unbelievable. And now, I... I, I say to my students, I couldn't play that piece that you're playing now when I was at music college, yeah. conservatoire level. That's how things have changed. 
I can't believe it. Yeah, it really is a golden age. It's exciting to be. It part. is. We could just do it with a few more gigs. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, Douglas, David, thank you for chiming in and being a part of this. I really appreciate it. You can find more about Jeff at discoverdoublebase.com. What a beautiful resource. Douglas Mapp, past president of the International Society of Bassists. You can go to douglasmapmusic.com and check out all those resources we were talking about. And David Hayes, recitalmusic.net. What a fantastic place to go to find bass ensemble music, solo bass music, bass and piano, you name it, recital music has it. I have so much fun doing these, not only over Skype and FaceTime or whatever, but live like this. And I'm just so appreciative of people taking the time and making the time to chat with me like these folks. And I appreciate you listening to this so much. You can't even believe it. It continues to boggle the mind that there are people out there listening to this, especially when I'm doing these openers and closers. And it really sounds like I'm a crazy person in my place in San Francisco, just yakking into my computer. So thank you for being on this journey with us. And how can you help the show? Some ask, you may ask, share this episode, share it with somebody that, you know, a student, a colleague, the parent of a bassist. We have a lot of bass moms and dads that follow along with the show. Share it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you hang out. That would mean so much to me. And if you haven't subscribed, ContraRaceConversations.com slash subscribe. You can get this via Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, our own app, so many different ways. And while you're there, send me a message. Let me know what you like about the show. Let me know about yourself. Let me know what you like to hear more of. That would be great. Feedback at ContraBaseConversations.com is how to do that. And since we're speaking of email, if you're not on our email list of many thousands of basis at this point, I'd love to have you there. You can stay updated not only with the show, but with what I'm up to in terms of travels for the podcast and even a couple personal bits and pieces as well. Contrabass Conversations is produced by Steve Hinchy, Michael Cooper, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. Mitch is making beautiful bases in the Dallas area. Check him out online at MitchMooring.com. And thank you to Krista Copper for cataloging and organizing all the topics we talk about. I can't tell you how helpful that is. And we've got some more topical thematic episodes because of her work coming very soon. I'm your host, Jason Heath, coming to you each and every week from San Francisco, California. And we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Uh-huh.